This is Greg with Fit for Expedition. We're going east of Tucson to a uh, colossal cave. It's a cave that has a storied history of bank robbers and the old west and buried treasure. I think we'll find the very treasure, Kelly. 50-50 uh, chance. 50-50 chance? Yeah. They will find that very treasure that nobody's ever found that was buried in the 1800s. Yeah. Late 1800s, probably. Uh, okay, 60-40. Six, oh, better chance. Cause yeah. It was, oh, okay. Okay. Well. Here's the map of the park. I wonder how old this map is. That's really old. But. We are going, well first we're going to the gift shop to get our tickets that we already paid for. And then, that looks like the cave entrance since it says cave entrance. Oh, and there's bat, there's, there's a bat. A bat is bigger than the cave, I'm a little nervous Yeah, now. giant bats in that cave. <laughs> Property has been placed on the National Register of Historic Places. 1934. <laughs> Honoring the young men who served in the Civilian Conservation Corps. This is a path less traveled, I can tell. Well, you'll be there soon. You can go up and go. Take it. Anyway, these are the bat species found in the park. I'm assuming. Look at that. Like a little rhino or something. Leaf nosed. And then insect feeding bats. Oh, there's a lot of different bats. You said there were nine kinds. There's nine. That's nine kinds. Mm -hmm. Which one's the cutest one? Um, that one. That one? Oh. This one over here is not bad. Yeah. But. Yeah. That's the cutie pie. That one's like, aww. Yeah. And I eat bugs, what's wrong with me? So Apparently maybe, there's maybe actually in the cave there, there there's are eleven nine, I heard. Okay. Nine. Nectar feeding bats of Colossal Cave. So and, and these are the desert plants that they feed off of. Bird of Paradise. Saworos. Well there's definitely plenty of saworos for them to feed off of. Uh -huh. They're all around. Yeah. And just as I said, there's plenty of these around here. Next, just turn left and there it is. That's a pretty thick one. Right in our path. Alright guys, for those on the one o'clock tour, if you guys want to line on up over on that side of the rope. Each group wants to grab one red dot, unless you want to send somebody all the way to the back, in which case you're more than welcome to. That is none of my business. Uh, does everybody have their little coupon things? I gotta make sure my name is on there. That doesn't say George. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yep, perfect. You have to change his name then. Huh? You have to change his name then. He didn't say it was supposed to say George. I know, he just said so it didn't. Welcome to Colossal exactly. Cave, guys. My name is Mike, and I will be your guide today. A couple things about our tour before we head in. This will be about a 45 minute long tour. We're going to do a half mile hike into the mountain and back out. We're also going to go down to about 60 feet deep and back up. That means there will be 363 stairs round trip. And if you're hoping to hear about our elevator, unlike that other cave, we don't have one. So 
So we are the largest dormant cave in the country. And what makes us a dormant cave is we do not have any natural water sources coming into our cave, which means in which that, those water sources are what's necessary for the limestone to erode away and for the crystals to form. The first people to use our cave were called the Hohokums. Uh, so the Hohokam people were groups of Native American nomadic traders that lived in this area back between 900 and 1450 AD. Because that was prehistoric times in the Americas, though, a lot of what we, know, think, what we believe about them is basically conjecture. It's just pieced together from what we've learned from different sites. They would have used this cave as a stop on their trade routes. They also would have used it for ceremonial purposes or simply storage. The main purpose they used this cave for, though, is a place to escape that heat during the summertime. We know that they used our cave because we found some artifacts left by them in this room. We found tools used for cooking, tools used for creating paints and dyes and things like that. But the surefire sign that they were here would be that smoke stain on the ceiling right in the center of the room. And that goes all the way up to the entrance. The next guy to use our cave was a guy named Solomon Lick. So in the late 1800s, this was all his ranch land. He also had a hotel a couple miles away. And Solomon, in 1879, was out looking for some lost cows one day, and he felt a really strange wind coming directly off the face of the mountain. Upon further investigation, Mr. Lick found the entryway that we just came in, except at the time, that hole was only about a meter tall by about half a meter wide. He crawled through that tiny little opening and found this room. Being a good businessman, Solomon immediately started drawing maps on how to get here from his hotel and taking out advertising space in the local newspapers that would say things like, If you stay at my hotel, there's a beautiful cave nearby that you can come explore all on your own. But up above us, we have crystals called stalactites that you can remember hang tight to the ceiling. Down below, we have stalagmites on the ground where you might trip over them. This formation in the center is known as flowstone, and on the edge of it is dripstone. And how these form is when water is traveling through the ground above us, it hits that limestone and picks up calcium. And it converts that calcium through a chemical process into a crystal calcite which it leaves behind as it's dripping from the ceiling in what start off as tiny little straw-like formations that are hollow at first, and that they build on themselves over time until uh, eventually become the icicle-looking formations above. So those grow at a rate of about one centimeter every 100 years, and that's only when the cave is active. When the water drips down to the ground, it takes any calcite, excess calcite with it and starts building these stalagmites from the bottom up. When they grow long enough, they actually connect, creating these columns. Flowstone is what happens when that calcite is left behind on top of a limestone structure in the cave. In this particular case, it was a boulder. So it poured off these stalactites above, poured over the sides of that limestone boulder, and left the calcite as a crystal shell around the rock that you can actually see where the water rippled along when you walk past it would get to the edge and drip down the sides, creating the dripstone, which is very aptly named and very similar to the stalactites and stalagmites that, um, that we have above and below. We have the ones above us that are broken off. And contrary to what cartoons will tell you, that is not a natural occurrence. That's almost always caused by uh, um, people taking souvenirs. Those in the back, when you get to the top, if you look straight up, you'll see my favorite stalactite in the cave just because it is so daunting hanging there. As we go around the corner though, we're gonna walk underneath the largest stalactite in the cave. His name's Fang. This guy is Fang. <laughs> so 
So guys, this is known as the drapery room. It got its name from this formation right here in the center. Kind of looks like curtains or drapes in your living room. So if you go underneath those though and look straight up into those curtains, and everybody will have a chance to, there are tiny little crystals in there known as helictites. You're gonna see different things in here. I get to experience brand new things myself, plus guests tell me what they see all the time too. It's a lot of fun. easiest place to get down to, but it's cool. Where's the cave bacon? Do you see it? Okay, there's the cave bacon. Bacon! All these dripping things. Cool. And then way up there stuff hanging down here is the bottomless pit let's see somebody get on there So those are some of the items that the whole Hokum left behind. Oh, okay. Found those in the entryway. Huh. The one you're at is the what they would have used to create paints. Guys, so welcome to the Movies and Popcorn Room. And how this room got its name is two different reasons, actually. First one we'll talk about is the popcorn. So if you look above us, you can see that limestone. And just below it is the calcite. So that's essentially the water line when this is an active cave. But as the cave drained at the end of the last ice age, which took, was a very long process, um, the water level would drop, leaving that calcite along the wall. It would also leave some water behind in the very porous limestone. That water that was left behind created its own calcite, which eventually had to go somewhere, and it came through the old calcite and created these little popcorn shapes. The movie's part of the name of this room is because our cave has been used as the shooting location of 20 different films and TV shows. The vast majority of those were absolutely terrible horror films from the 1960s and 70s including Night, Night of the Leepoos, about a bunch of giant man-eating bunny rabbits that terrorized the countryside and lived in our cave. <clears throat> One show, though, that actually is very popular, and most everyone has heard of it, was Sesame Street in 1988. Did a special where Big Bird and friends went on an adventure looking for lost treasure. So Big Bird came down that hallway that we all just did. 
When he came around the corner though, Big Bird saw this rock right here, which he mistook for a giant Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> so Big Bird did what any of us probably should do when confronted with a T-Rex. He took off running, right through this very conveniently shaped hole in the wall. Mm. <laughs> and on the other side, he found his treasure of birds eating cookies for him and Cookie Monster. <laughs> so that is known as a keyhole formation. It was there well before Big Bird, but it's what inspired them to use this room for that episode, which I think is kind of cool. And down this next hallway, a couple display cases, the first one of which is items that the bandits that used to hide out here you would have left behind. Second, gear that we would have given to you guys back in the 1920s to take a tour. A lot of open flame on that one. And the third is the tools that the CCC would have used, including that wheelbarrow. 1880, 1900, outlaws hold up in class. Okay. Yeah. Wait a minute. Every cave in the West needs a bandit story. <laughs> oh, isn't, there, isn't there supposed to be hidden treasure here somewhere and nobody ever found it? There is a legend, yes. Yes. I will definitely tell you the legend, but I'll tell you to the legend where we found the book cut open Wells Fargo by facts. Oh, okay. So, here's the gear that we would have given you guys in the 20s. I would have accidentally lit myself on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and not only does that wheel weigh 60 pounds, it falls off every five turns. Probably. According to the woman that brought it down here. Oh, really? <laughs> Now, is that actual stuff? Or? Uh, most of the stuff we have down here is just it's replica. It's yeah. what you yeah. would have seen. The hat is genuine. Um, okay. The Hohokam artifacts are genuine. that robbed about four trains in just about a year. So after that four train robbery, a local sheriff here in Tucson gathered up a posse and he chased those bandits up to this cave. Well, as soon as they got inside and had the cover of darkness, our bandits turned around and started shooting out of the opening at the sheriff and his men. Not liking the idea of getting shot at by people they couldn't see, they took cover and decided to wait them out, thinking they're gonna run out of food and water eventually, they've got to come out sometime. Well, they were waiting up there for about two weeks when word gets around to them that there's a group of guys in one of the nearby towns at a saloon, partying up a storm, and bragging about how they just robbed a train and left the sheriff sitting outside a cave. Realizing there's more than one way in and out of here, kind of embarrassed and more than a little angry, the sheriff and his men rode into town and the Wild West gunfight ensued. At the end of it all, there was only one surviving bandit. So that bandit was given an option. You can take us back up to the cave and give us back that gold, or you can go to prison. The bandit weighed his options, knowing that it was guesstimated at $70,000 worth of gold and cash hidden up here, he decided a little bit of prison time didn't sound so bad if he could just come back and get it himself. Well, he was sentenced to 18 years, which is plenty of time for rumor mill to get around, the legend of the gold to get around, so by the time he came back to town, there were quite a few people that were more than happy to follow him relentlessly every time he came up here. And they watched him coming in and out of all the different entrances and exits, but no one ever saw him carrying anything when he left. So what they believe is our bandit forgot where he hid the gold while he was locked up all that time. As you're exiting the room, please keep an eye out for Bone Crusher, this crystal formation right here. He has broken the nose of two tour guides that were not watching where they were going, so keep an eye out for him. So this formation on my left is known as the Silent Waterfall. As beautiful as it is right now, and it's a wonderful photo opportunity, I like to imagine back when this was an active cave. That was also an active waterfall. All that dust and pollen gets washed away, exposing all the crystal underneath it. I think it would have been an amazing sight. Different species of bats that use okay. the cave at different points throughout the year. Uh -huh. uh, we also have some pack rats, 
that live in here. Um, <laughs> There's always pack rats, right? A couple okay. of cave crickets that I've seen now and again. Um, but we also have a bunch of Kawatamundi that call this place home. Uh, there's about 12 of them that live inside the cave. Um, they are the cutest little face scratcher uppers you've ever seen. They're related to raccoons, and they will steal anything that's not nailed down. Um, they got into our margarita machine a couple months ago, which uh, the guy that opened up the cave next day was just like, wow, a bunch of drunk Kawati on the floor. <laughs> Nature. Sure. This, this is this this is pretty awesome. This is right outside the cave. This is probably built by the, what was it, the Conservation Corps? Civilian uh -huh. Conservation Corps. Uh -huh. I'm guessing, and I'm tripping over, over their work, so. Yes. <laughs> but, it's pretty cool. There's so much stonework here. And that building back there, it's really cool. The caretaker used to live in that house. Some cool fossil stuff. I don't know a lot about this, but I do like them. Oh, are those Kota Monday? Kota Monday. That guys. one definitely, that one says Kota Monday on it. Those are pretty good. Oh, yeah. They're cool in the dark. Kind of fitting for cave features. Only $16.99. That's actually pretty good. Look mm -hmm. this old photo. Or, yeah, it's an old photo. That's me when I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of colossal crystals. That's not bad. Eight bucks. Because coffee mugs are so expensive when you look on look for them. Kind of like snow glows, but they're like sand glows and they're there's no water because it's the desert. That's kind of an interesting idea. That's pretty cool. If you haven't seen any of our videos before, but you liked it, hit the subscribe button. Also, also, if you want to get notifications of new videos as they come up just ring that little bell this is a a one pound little one pound dumbbell hey and also share this with your friends if you think they'd like it and once again thanks for joining us at fit for expedition <laughs>